It is a bitterly cold start to the week across central and eastern Kentucky. Now we turn our attention to developing snow threats. We'll have the latest coming up. With temperatures dropping, the need for warm shelters is growing. We'll take you out to Rowan County, where a shelter is not turning anyone away. Some thieves broke into cars while their owners were inside worshiping in church. We'll show you how their actions were caught on tape. WKYT News starts now with First Alert Weather. Good evening. Bitterly cold temperatures continue to stick around tonight. Temperatures will sink back into the single digits, and with the wind chill, it could feel even colder. That's why our WKYT First Alert Severe Weather Day continues. Chief Meteorologist Chris Bailey has the early look at your forecast. Yeah, the bitterly cold stuff, guys, not only across Kentucky, much of the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes, and really the biting cold going all the way into parts of the Deep South as of right now. Certainly not as cold as what folks across the Midwest and the Ohio Valley are seeing, but look to our Northwest where the air is coming from. One is a lonely number across the Minneapolis area. What we're getting in on now, those gusty winds that will continue to give us a wind chill that will drop below zero as the evening wears on. This is a wind chill forecast that will take those numbers tonight as low as minus five to potentially down to 10 below zero again across parts of northern Kentucky first thing tomorrow morning. So keep that in mind. Those current wind chills are generally now into the low single digits. Feels like it is two into Covington. Four is the wind chill in Lexington. Three for the good folks into the Richmond area. Nothing showing up on your Defender radar network. It's a mainly clear sky with Arctic cold, dry Arctic air in place as the sun sets now over the next few minutes. We're going to notice a very rapid drop in temperatures and that will set the stage for another bitterly cold night. Little light snow coming in for Wednesday. That'll put down accumulations for much of the area. Then we'll focus on a winter storm potentially lurking for Friday and Saturday. The latest, guys, with the hour by hour forecast on a busy week of winter weather is just ahead. With temperatures slipping, the need for warming shelters is growing, and Rowan County city leaders have opened a shelter in Moorhead. And they're setting up a staging area at the Gateway House starting at 6 tonight. Anyone who needs a place to go is welcome. Victor Puente continues our first alert team weather coverage in Moorhead. City leaders are ready to open the building behind me if they get a big enough turnout. They say no matter where they end up, their hope is that no one near Moorhead has to worry about how they'll stay warm tonight. This program started last winter as being led by the Gateway House Homeless Shelter. They say anyone who needs a warm place to stay tonight will have one. The temperatures, when they drop that low, it's dangerous for anybody to be outside. And we just want to make sure that um, we are providing a service for those that need a, a warm place to stay. They're setting a staging area at the Gateway House from 6 to 9. The shelter's director tells me if only a few people show up, They'll keep them at the shelter. If they get a bigger crowd, they'll open up the Carl D. Perkins Center. They're also looking for volunteers to help out tonight. Either way, when the temperature is this low, they say they want to make sure no one is out in it very long. If it's for one family or one person, it doesn't matter. We've had it open for for one person. And our job as a city and our job as a city government and a county government is to, you know, our first job is to serve the people. The shelter isn't limited just to people who live in Moorhead. Mayor Trent says they won't turn away anyone who needs a warm place to stay tonight. In Rowan County, Victor Puente, WKYT. Now, the Gateway House is working with local law enforcement. They say officers know to direct anyone in need tonight to the shelter. Remember, you can track the cold forecast and check out our weather headlines on WKYT.com and the WKYT News app. Dozens of Dozens of people braved this morning's cold temperatures in Harrison County for the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day March. WKYT videographer Darnell Crenshaw talked to marchers who didn't let the weather keep them from keeping King's dream alive. It's cold out here today, but it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Uh, the wind has a little brisk in it. The temperature's down to about uh, uh, 12 degrees, but we're going to continue the march. It's never too cold to march. Why is that? Because the, the day that the, that's being represented here today is is a day that uh, that, that that acknowledges a great man uh, that uh, done a lot of things for uh, people 
uh, in this community and people all over the world. No, sir, not too cold to march. Why not? Yeah, we're marching for Dr. Martin Luther King and for the Lord. <laughs> Of course it's not too cold. We'll think about the, the contributions and the sacrifices that our forefathers and Dr. King made. They didn't let a little cold stop them or a little heat. So we are continuing to march in their footsteps and to carry on the dream, to live out the dream. I think I'd rather be marching for him because, you know, if it wasn't for him, everybody wouldn't be together, have come together like this. It goes on. The, the issue never quite solves itself, and I think 40 years from now we'll probably still be marching. Hopefully, maybe it wouldn't be necessary, but uh, we'll certainly be marching next year. 40 years later, we can continue to march, More than ever. but we continue to to carry out and try to live the dream. And we've got to start dreaming and start acting 40 years later. Those are great words there. Organizers shortened today's march route because of the extreme cold temperatures. Firefighters are blaming a wood-burning stove for causing a fire this morning. Our county-by-county -county coverage at 530 begins in Harrison County. Firefighters say someone driving along U.S. 62 about uh, this morning saw the house on fire and stopped. We're told they banged on the door to get the people out. The couple inside was asleep and had no idea their attic was on fire, but they managed to get out safely. No injuries were reported. And in Laurel County, two men faced charges in connection with a stolen car case. Deputies say they found 33-year-old Harry Castle sitting in a car on J. Chestnut Road late last night. Deputies tell us the car had been reported stolen earlier in the day from a car lot in Clay County. Castle admitted to de deputies that he and some other people took the car. A passenger in the car, 25-year-old Franklin Parks, was also arrested. Police in Southern Kentucky are looking for some bold thieves. They say someone drove around Whitley County yesterday and broke into cars at three different churches between 10 a.m. and noon. Bill Pendleton takes a look at some surveillance video of the thieves in this Crime Tracker report. A minivan pulls up to Goldbug Baptist Church just before noon Sunday and minutes before the services were over. They were slick at it. We never heard a thing. Yet video clearly shows one guy taking multiple swings with some kind of object to break out the driver's side window of the car. Church is one place you can go kind of refuge, you know, you can be at peace, and but it's not that way anymore. Goldbug Baptist was among three churches hit while the car's owners were inside worshiping. Kind of makes you wonder how long it'll be before they start coming in with their guns and robbing the congregations. Police say the best advice to avoid being a victim is to keep your valuables in the back or in a trunk out of sight where thieves can't see them. Police say the pair did target many other cars before breaking into the ones they did. They checked a couple of cars out prior. The reason they didn't break into them, they couldn't see anything laying in the seat. Pastor Leonard Seiler says the victim is a 50-year-old woman who depended on her car to get to Lexington. You know, she was kind of at the bottom. She, her mother's got cancer. She was making a lot of trips to Lexington, and, and it just wasn't a good time, you know. Yet he says it'll be a good time for them and even the thief to catch them. I hope they find a better route to take life than what they're doing. In Whitley County, they'll get their justice. It'll come one way or the other. Phil Pendleton, WKYT. Police say the van in that video appears to be a dark blue or black Chrysler town and country. We're told cars were also broken into at Main Street Baptist and Freewell Baptist. The average woman paints her nails once a week. Nail polish contains several chemicals, and new research discovered that one chemical, not only on a woman's nails, but also inside their bodies. I'm going to use yellow now. From the nursery to the nail salon, polish is popular with girls of all ages. But a joint study by Duke University and the Environmental Working Group finds chemicals in some polishes can get inside your body. EWD's Tasha Stoiber says researchers tested women for signs of the common chemical flame retardant triphenylphosphate, or TPHP. Every woman had elevated levels after they painted their nails. Nail polish is the only personal care product that has this chemical listed as an ingredient. The EWG estimates about half of all nail polishes have TPHP, which is also used as a flame retardant in some foam furniture like couches. 
And while the group says more research is needed on the effects of this chemical in humans, animal studies indicate TPHP is linked to reproductive and developmental issues. <laughs> That's surprising news to Jenna High, who lets her children play with nail polish. I was shocked. I would say that I'm pretty cautious about what I expose my kids to, and nail polish is definitely not one of the things that I ever worried about. In a statement, the group that represents nail polish manufacturers calls the research speculative and misleading and points out that TPHP has been widely used and safely used across many industries, including to prevent electrical automobile and furniture fires. I think that I will continue to let my kids use nail polish every once in a while because it is a fun thing that they obviously enjoy doing, but I will be more cautious about doing so. EWG launched a consumer petition to press companies that make popular nail polish brands to stop using TPHP. Now, market surveys show an overwhelming 97% of American girls ages 12 to 14 use nail products, including polish, and 14% of all teens and tweens use them every day. Officer Don, thank you. Potential candidates have one week left to file to run in this year's election. And the Bevin administration still has a big decision to make. Bill Bryant has the details in the bottom line. Good evening. A week from tomorrow, January 26th, is a big day to watch in Kentucky. It's the filing deadline for partisan candidates running in this year's elections, and it's the day that Governor Matt Bevin will deliver his State of the Commonwealth and budget address. Bevin tweeted pictures of his team crunching numbers for his budget proposal over the weekend. He says to prepare for four years of fiscal responsibility. The governor has already indicated he has received requests for more than $2 billion in new spending, which he indicated won't be happening. A major decision still facing the Bevan administration is who will head up the Kentucky State Police during the governor's tenure. Justice Secretary John Tilley has announced a seven-member committee will make a recommendation to the governor for a KSP commissioner. That group will be chaired by Lexington State Representative Robert Benvenuti. It will also include two active and two retired troopers and a community representative. After the toughest debate yet among the Democratic presidential field, the Candidates spent today in Charleston, South Carolina, commemorating Martin Luther King Jr. Day. During the debate last night, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders had some sharp exchanges over gun rules, health care, and Wall Street. Some new nationwide polls out today, but taken before the debate, show Clinton widening her lead over Sanders. But Sanders leads in New Hampshire, and it's a toss up in Iowa. Martin O'Malley, who trails both Clinton and Sanders, got little time in last night's debate to make up the difference. And back locally, with next week's filing deadline approaching, all 12 incumbent district council members in Lexington have filed for re-election. In the 12th district, incumbent Russ Henry, who was appointed to fill the term of the late Ed Lane, faces a challenger. Former United Way President Kathy Plowman has also filed in the 12th. Bill Bryant, WKYT. A piece of history literally came rolling into Corbin this morning. One of the last operating steam engines arrived back in Corbin. The L&N 2132 engine last operated in the Corbin yard in the 1920s, but has been in a yard in Georgia for the last 30 years. It is one of the last remaining engines in the world built at the South Louisville shops. Corbin was founded on the L&N Railroad. Um, this, this piece is an artifact. It's a historical artifact that is important to the history and the heritage of the city of Corbin. We are told that the engine will stay in downtown Corbin near a historical L&N caboose just off of Main Street.